call of you to take this into your hearts and souls too and your bones and get out there and teach your friends and if they don't listen, hit them on the head. Okay. Um, so that's uranium. Anyway, you enrich the uranium to 3%. I won't go into the whole details, but it's all in this book. Also, I, I guess I need to mention that nuclear power is exorbitantly expensive. It costs now 10 to 13 billion dollars to build a nuclear reactor. And you know who pays for that? You do. I do too, because I pay tax here too, which I really resent, because most of it goes to the Pentagon. Um, so you totally pay for the construction, the enrichment, the insurance, everything. You can't insure your house against nuclear power accidents, you can't insure yourself, nothing. But it all comes from your tax dollars. And then the utilities grab the reactor once it's built and pump out the electricity like there's no tomorrow and they make huge profits. That's why they don't want to close the reactors down because it's too expensive to build more. Now the cost of decommissioning or taking apart an old radioactive reactor is beyond compare, much more expensive than building it and no one's ever done it. And you have to wait till they cool down because they're so terribly radioactively hot and they have to be taken apart by robots and remote control. It's interesting at Fukushima, Japan is the leading producer of robots, yet they had never made robots to withstand very high radiation areas because they always assumed that they wouldn't have an accident. So they had no robots to deal with what they're dealing with now. Isn't it interesting, the psychic numbing that people practice, and we all practice psychic numbing, except children. Children don't. But mummy, why is that? I mean, kids are so honest and alert, and it's only when their hormones, those nasty things, start circulating at menarche, um, that the kids go, they lose it and they are able then psychologically to block out up unpleasant realities. And my grandson Paulie's going through this at the moment. He was a gorgeous kid who looked like a face on the Sistine Chapel and suddenly he's getting all hairy. And you know, he'd say, how are you Paulie? Mm -hmm. He won't even talk to me anymore. And as Penny, <laughs> my daughter said to him and his sort of hairy friends that trudge through the house, <laughs> she says, well, we can't really trust you because your frontal lobes haven't developed yet. They haven't. <laughs> okay, so, so cost. I mean, I say no more, it's just ridiculous, the cost of nuclear power. Why do people want nuclear power? Well, again, it's a midbrain attitude. Um, you know, when they split the atom, it was very exciting. And in my other book, Nuclear Power, um, The New Nuclear Danger, there's a fascinating study by a, an anthropologist called Hugh Gustafson who went to live with the weapons makers in Los Alamos for a year. And he used to drink beer with them in the pub at night and go to church with them. And actually many of them are his dear friends. And it, their psychology is absolutely amazing. When a man designs a new nuclear weapon that's to be tested in the desert in Nevada, he, that night, goes out and sleeps with the weapon alone in the desert before it's exploded the next day. And he talks about having labour pains, I kid you not, and the need to push. When the weapon explodes, he then talks about postnatal depression. Yeah, isn't that fascinating? So, the emergence of new life, the crea creation of new life is compared to annihilation in these men's minds. And, and they talk about people being killed, that's collateral damage. We're inanimate objects, whereas the weapons, um, they grow whiskers as they get old. They have arms and legs. Um, there's a triad, and they're, you know, they're arms, nuclear arms. Uh, and they have all sorts of human characteristics. And it's very important that we as physicians look at the psychology behind what drives these men. Similarly, with nuclear power, the Department of Energy calls solar power and wind power soft energy, like as my father would have said, you know, his name's Cedric and he's got lace on his underpants sort of thing. Dad hadn't grown up at a time when there were gay people. Um, but nuclear power is hard energy, okay? So there's a fascination with this, combined with the fact that 
I wrote an article for the New York Times on December 2nd where there was a psychologist in the Department of Defense, I can't remember his name, in 52, who said, we need nuclear power, virtues a camouflage for the weapons industry, because it's one and the same technology. So kid yourselves not, it's all part of blowing up the planet, which is ultimate power and ultimate instinct for annihilation. Isn't that fascinating? We have to start examining this and getting into the etiology. Okay, now I want to walk you through Fukushima and what's been happening and also Chernobyl and what sort of medical implications would be involved with what's going on at Fukushima. So where you build the reactor, which looks like this, um, and you pack 100 tonnes of uranium into the reactor, enriched to 3% of 235. The uranium is formed into little ceramic pellets packed in zirconium fuel rods 12 feet long and half an inch thick, like a curtain rod. Oh, you call them drapes, don't you? We call them curtains. Okay, so 100 tonnes. And then between these uh, fuel rods are are boron moderating rods, which moderate the flux of neutrons. The whole thing's immersed in water, and you gradually pull out the moderating rods, and then the whole mass of uranium, 100 tons, reaches critical mass, and the atoms start breaking apart spontaneously as the uranium atom shoots out a neutron, neutron shoots into another uranium atom, which shoots out two more, and then on and on. And as the uranium atoms are hit by the neutrons, they fracture into various particles uh, and 200 new radioactive elements are formed, none of which existed before man fissioned the atom. They're all highly toxic, much more so than uranium, which is pretty toxic itself. And so as they pull the moderating rods out, you therefore, as the atom split, release E equals mc squared. Energy equals the mass of the atom times the speed of the light squared, the most enormous sort of energy that Einstein developed when he watched, a tr uh, suddenly discovered when he watched a tram go by and realised E equals MC squared. <laughs> what a brain. I think he was operating from his neocortex. Um, anyway, so as that energy is released, there's tremendous heat and the heat boils the water and then the water turns to steam, steam's taken off which turns a generator which generates electricity. So all a nuclear power plant is designed to do is to boil water. That's all it's designed to do. It's like cutting a pound of butter with a, with a chainsaw. Right? Get it? But what is actually made, and, and how much radiation then is developed in this reactor? The equivalent of a thousand Hiroshima-sized bombs. That's what is in these reactors. But then, every year they have to remove 30 tonnes of the fuel rods because they're so full of these elements that are so stinking hot radiologically and thermally that they're inefficient for the reaction. And usually the fuel pools, spent fuel pools, which they euphemistically call swimming pools, are on the roof of the reactors. And they're packed on racks. But because the nuclear industry thought that by this time there would be a place to put their spent fuel, they didn't build enough spent fuel pools, so they're re-racking the rods closer and closer together and there could be a meltdown in the spent fuel pools and there were, there were in Japan. At Pilgrim nuclear power plant, at the entrance of Cape Cod where the Kennedys used to live, um, there's more cesium-137 in the spent fuel pool than that released by all the atmospheric atomic explosions conducted by Russia, China, United States, France and England. More cesium in one spent fuel pool. And if that melts down, well, you can imagine where that would go. Be much worse than, than Fukushima. Now, as a reactor operates, it routinely emits radioactive elements because it can't operate without doing it. And you know, they use these euphemisms. Oh, it's just routine releases. Don't worry about it. You know, I'm just routinely radiating you. So, you know, you might get cancer later, but it's just routine. Don't worry about it. Okay? <laughs> so let me talk about what they routinely release every day. Xenon, argon, and krypton. Now, these are called noble gases. They're gamma emitters. And I didn't walk you through the radiation. You all understand X-rays. We're the biggest irradiators of the public. 
um, CT scans give you a whopping dose, never have a CT scan unless absolutely indicated. Each dose of radiation is dangerous. There is no radiation that is safe and it's cumulative. So each dose you receive adds to your risk of get, getting cancer. Do not walk through those x-ray machines at the airports. I don't care if they stick their fingers in all my orifices. I'm not going to go through those machines. And they are sending fetuses through them. Fetuses are thousands of times more radiosensitive than adults. One x-ray to the pregnant abdomen doubles the incidence of leukemia in that baby. That's Alice Stewart's work, an English woman who was roundly criticized by the nuclear industry until they found out that she was actually correct. She was once testifying before a Senate committee here. She was great in English. And uh, one, one senator was giving her a bad time and she turned to him and said, now listen to me, young man. That shut him up. Anyway, there are the, so there are x-rays and they just pass straight through you, but at the instant they pass through you, you can be damaged and a mutation can occur in a gene, right? Gamma radiation is like x-rays. Non-particulate goes straight through you. Alpha radiation, two protons and two neutrons emitted from an unstable atom. Very, very mutagenic. Alpha particles don't pass through the skin, the layers of dead layers of epidermis to damage living cells. But when in contact with living cells in the lung, gut, liver, you name it, very carcinogenic. Uh, uranium is an alpha emitter. Beta is an electron emitted from an unstable. They all do the same thing. So for those who aren't physicians, in every cell is a nucleus, there are chromosomes, and there, are, there is a gene or pair of genes called the regulatory gene that controls the rate of cell division. If hit by some radiation, and I'm missing it each time I got it then, the DNA molecule of the cell doesn't die, is mutated or biochemically altered. So one, and the cell will sit dormant for any time from five to 70 years, which is the incubation time for cancer. And one day, instead of the cell dividing into two by mitosis, it goes crazy and produces trillions of cells. That's a cancer. And the cells are very invasive and they'll get into a lymph vessel or a blood vessel and one cell will go up to the brain and grow into a second cancer. And that's called metastasizing. And the body eventually becomes full of cancers and a cancer is a parasite. And it grows and proliferates and then as the body just withers away and dies, when the body dies, the cancer dies. So it takes a single alpha particle to hit a single gene in a single cell to kill you. Get it? Now there are other genes that are more important than normal cells, somatic cells in the body, and they're called the germ cells, the sperm and the eggs. And the sperm and eggs carry all the genes for future generations, and all those genes are vulnerable to being damaged by radiation. We all carry several hundred genes for disease. Why? Because it's radiation over time that induced evolution. Radiation caused the fish to develop lungs and the birds to develop wings. And for us to evolve into this incredible creature with, with uh, an opposing thumb and this huge neocortex. But most mutations are deleterious. They cause disease. Very few are advantageous to survive in a difficult environment. But they occur over billions of years. And what we're doing by increasing the level of background radiation in our food and our air through nuclear power and Hanford and the like is increasing the number of deleterious mutations. Now, interestingly, I've been saying this for years, yeah, we all carry several hundred genes for disease like diabetes and cystic fibrosis, my specialty. There are 2,600 genetic diseases. You all must listen to this. It's very important. But the other day, my son was diagnosed with hemochromatosis. Hemochromatosis is a disease which is an abnormality in iron metabolism and you collect iron in your tissues and you can get cardiomyopathy, it, it destroys the heart muscle, you can get cirrhosis of the liver. I therefore carry the recessive gene for hemochromatosis. You could have knocked me over with a feather and so does my ex-husband. Isn't that fascinating? called a Mendelian recessive. And normally Mendelian recessives 
take about 20 generations for the two of them to get together to express a disease like diabetes or cystic fibrosis or hemoglobin.